Okay, thanks for being here. The topic of today's talk is, is China the new Silicon Valley? This picture is me at a night market in Beijing, and I just bought a regional specialty, and that is fried Scorpio. So when you go to the night market, you see all kinds of big spiders and all sorts of insects, and apparently fried Scorpio is one of them. And I think the special thing about that for me was not even the Scorpio, but the fact that I was able to pay it with my phone, and I'm going to show you in a minute how I got there. As was said in the introduction, in the past, when you wanted to know about the latest trends in the digital world, it was very easy. You book your flight from Germany to Silicon Valley to San Francisco, meet with some VCs, meet with some companies over there, and then you were pretty much up to date about the latest trends. But recently, I found that the trends in China were a lot more interesting, and the speed of technological evolution and disruption was a lot faster in China. I'm going to cover four topics today. One is to briefly illustrate the rise of China in the past couple of years. The second one is going to be about mobile commerce in China. The third topic, especially interesting for this audience, are the media trends in China. We will conclude with the question, which of those media trends will actually come to Europe. So let's start with the rise of China. You may be surprised at the question, is China the new Silicon Valley? Because in Germany and lots of parts of the Western world, there's still the perception that China is merely a copycat country, that they're not actually able to do any innovation themselves. So when you think of Chinese products, you don't really think of high-tech products, but you rather think of something like this, like fake Louis Vuitton bags. But actually, in the past couple of years, they've become world leaders in a lot of different categories, such as mobile commerce and payment, delivery services, virtual reality, sharing economy, and even artificial intelligence. And in the next very short video, I'm going to illustrate very briefly how fast they have risen in the past couple of years. So what you will see in the next short video is actually the GDP development for different countries in the past 20 years. So I find this super impressive because every one of us knows that China is big, but just to imagine that just 20 years ago, it was not even on the top 10, top 15 of the largest GDPs in the world is quite remarkable. And you saw how it got into overdrive growth mode in the past five years. When we talk about digital companies, we all know the American companies. And for every American giant, there is a Chinese equivalent. And again, in the past, you would have said, hey, those are probably just some cheap copycats that can only exist because China doesn't let the original co uh, company into the country. But in reality, I think for almost half of those companies, the Chinese company is already a lot bigger. So for instance, a company like Toutiao in the middle is sometimes called the Chinese BuzzFeed. The only difference is, is that the actual BuzzFeed is worth around 1 billion and the Chinese BuzzFeed is worth 75 billion. So this just shows you the scale of some of those companies. And I think this is true for like half of those companies. Also, when you look at the list of the world's most valuable tech companies, there's a top 20. Only two colors on this chart, blue and red. And there's like half of them are already Chinese. And most of them were founded in the past 10 or 15 years. And when you think about the largest German tech company, what, what is it? When was it founded? So it's actually SAP. And they were founded at like 1980, I think. So almost 40 years ago. Our flagship company is 40 years old. And there's like 10, 20 of those companies that have only been founded in the past five or 10 years. So in the US, you talk a lot about the GAFA economy, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. And the companies you should know in China are the BAT and the TMD. BAT, you probably know. They are Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, roughly comparable to Google, Amazon, and Facebook. But the TMD, they are also very interesting. Those are the companies called Toutiao, Meituan, and Didi. And they are roughly equivalent to companies like, as I said, BuzzFeed, but also Groupon or even Uber, but a lot more valuable and a lot larger. So to answer the question, is China the new Silicon Valley? I would actually say it's not only the new Silicon Valley, but it's the Silicon Valley on steroids. 
because they have actually learned the playbook from Silicon Valley companies. They know exactly how Google or Facebook work, and then they put their special sauce, their extra Chinese ingredients into it, and create companies that are a lot bigger and grow a lot faster. So now let's talk about mobile commerce. I think one of the main things that distinguishes China is really that they live in a mobile-only world. So it's not mobile first, it's mobile only. And whereas in the West, we still talk about stuff like, hey, we have this desktop website, and now we have to adapt it to mobile, and we need to have a responsive website or something like that. The Chinese people, they wouldn't even understand you, because basically they leapfrogged the whole desktop thing and went straight to mobile. And as we will see, this is actually a super big advantage, because they don't have to deal with the legacy technology, and instead they are jumping right into the future. One topic that only exists in China, doesn't even exist in the US, are the so-called super apps. And super apps are apps that can do basically anything you would want on the phone. And I'm going to show you a short clip of a day in China, in Beijing, of how to use the super app. In Deutschland im Restaurant nervt es mich ja immer, wenn ich entweder lange Schlange stehen muss oder mich an den Tisch setze und dann ganz lange warten muss, bis ein Kellner kommt. Hier geht das Ganze ein bisschen anders. Genau, jetzt kann ich einfach hier mein Menü auswählen, bezahle, dann kommt das Ganze an den Tisch. Und jeder kennt das Gefühl, man ist den ganzen Tag unterwegs und dann ist das Handy auf einmal aus. Wir haben jetzt hier unseren Automaten, wo wir jetzt eben so einen Akku ausleihen können. So, ja, Handy wieder aufgeladen, jetzt gehen wir das Ganze wieder zurück. Fertig. Hallo, wo ist das nächste Restaurant? So, as you can see, uh, you can do a whole lot of stuff with your super apps. And the cool thing about it is that, on the one hand, it's very high tech. On the other hand, it's very low tech because they use QR code as a technology that has never been successful in the West. And in China, it's really cool that wherever you see a QR code, you just know you can scan it and then something yeah, fun or something cool is going to happen. And all the things that I did, I only did it with one app and that was WeChat. In Germany, to do the same things, I would have had to register with 20 different services, put my credit card and payment details in 20 times. And in China, you do it all with a couple of apps. And these are WeChat, Alipay or Meituan and they basically replace all your social media apps. They allow you to book a restaurant, to order food, to call a taxi, to buy stock, to pay your electricity bill, to do dating, to do shopping, pretty much everything. Once you use it, you just wonder why it doesn't exist in the West, and it's really strange that Facebook still hasn't managed to turn WhatsApp into the WeChat of the West, even though they have bought it five years ago for $20 billion. So bike sharing is coming from China, so just outside of this building, I saw some Mo bikes. These are Chinese companies, so now they're also expanding into the West. What you have to understand about China is that as soon as there's a new business model, there's like a lot of competition in every area. And there's always like copycats of this business model, even in China. So here you can see different colors of different bike sharing companies. They are pretty much everywhere in China. So you have 50 companies that are basically offering the same service, and only the best one can survive. And obviously, sometimes the Chinese, they will kind of overdo it because at some point it will look something like this and that maybe bike sharing is not as ecologically friendly as it is supposed to be, but it just shows you how fast they are when they roll out their business models. You can pay everywhere with your phone. And the fascinating thing is that mobile payment is not just a question of, hey, there's this uh, super cool digital hipster or like a Berlin hipster who is like the 0.1% of the population who knows how to pay with this. But wherever you go, whether it's a big city, small city, whether it's educated people, non-educated people, young people, old people, everyone is paying with this app, and they have basically gotten rid of cash within a couple of years. You can do everything with your mobile phone. You can even order coffee, and you will have it within five minutes, because the way that they work is everything is offered for delivery. So they will have like hundreds of coffee spots everywhere in town and deliver you coffee within a couple of minutes. 
when you go to a supermarket, you will have the opportunity ju to just scan the products, and then you will know exactly where the food is coming from, when it was harvested, and what the quality of it is. If you pick up some food, you can decide whether you want to buy it and take it with you, buy it and have it delivered, or buy it and just eat it at a restaurant. And you can have everything delivered within 30 minutes if you live within a three-mile radius of the supermarket. And so now a lot of people are just trying to live within this three-mile radius because it just makes life so convenient. There are cashierless supermarkets, basically like big vending machines where you go in, there are cameras, you register with your app, you go out and you just pay with your app, so there are no cashiers over there. And now this may remind you of Amazon Go, but actually there's like a couple of Amazon Go's in the world, I think maybe three right now, so it's more like a concept if you ask me. Whereas Bingo Box has already thousands of stores. So again, China is using a very low-tech technology. So Bingo Box is not as advanced as Amazon Go, but they use the low-tech technology because they say it's more important to roll out really quickly rather than have the highest tech. And now you saw some examples of automation and how they're buying things. And I think the following example is, to me, kind of crazy, but also shows you what kind of imagination they have. And this is a video about how they do a car test drive in China. So basically, you register in the app. There's like verification with kind of a face ID. So you just go to the store, to the car dealership. You get the verification. And then the cars are coming down from like a big vending machine, basically. There's not a single person there who is looking after the cars. And then you just sit in, you drive it as long as you want to, and then you just return it. And because your WeChat Pay or your Alipay is connected to your whole credit score and with your bank, there's no risk for them, and it allows them to do such things which are like completely unthinkable in Germany. So now let's talk about media trends from China. So if you want to understand media trends in 2018, we need to understand two consumers really well. I think this consumer, we understand her pretty well because we know all of the apps. But I think the more interesting one is actually this one. You see that there is no overlap in any of those logos because the German consumer looks the same as the American consumer. But this one is totally different because they have their own ecosystem. First of all, let's talk about esports. Esports, as you know, is really on the rise, but I think this year it has hit a new level. So the question is esports soon going to be bigger than soccer? What you can see here is like the final of some big esports event. You know that there is like 20,000 people in attendance, but even millions watching the live stream at the same moment. And what does this have to do with China? Actually, some of the biggest titles in the world are actually owned by the company Tencent. So Tencent is mostly known for WeChat, but actually they are a huge shareholder in Fortnite. They bought Clash of Clans, League of Legends. They have the license for Player Unknown's Battleground. So China is actually producing a lot of the games that our kids are playing today. Esports is really huge in China, and so teams like this one, they are really super famous, more famous than soccer players probably. The way they live and train is also quite interesting because most of them live in a really nice house. It's like the team house, and this house has everything. So they live there 24-7, but they will have chefs, they will have fitness coaches, they will have people who look after them. So a typical day is basically wake up, get a healthy breakfast, do some workout, and then maybe a two or three hour play session. Then maybe some healthy lunch, maybe a little nap, recover for 30 minutes, and then afterwards there may be some coaching sessions where people will explain, hey, you should have adopted this strategy instead of this one. So it's like super, super professional. And the prize monies for those events are really big. The largest tournaments now get a 30 million prize pool. The winner team gets like 8 million. So it's, it's really interesting for corporate sponsorship as well and for advertising. And that's also the reason why a lot of people want to become esports superstars right now. And now in China, you can even study esports. And the way it works is that, let's say, all of you guys, you are the esports students in the first semester. You all dream of becoming the next esports superstar. And yet at the end of the first year, I'm like the professor, and I will select maybe 10, 20, where I see you have the potential to actually become esports stars, and you will be trained to become this. But the rest of you, you will not be kicked out, but you will become kind of like the esports business guys. So you will do like finance for esports, you will do event management for esports, marketing and all that sort of stuff. And now you may think, hey, that's kind of weird to have an esports business degree, but there's also like health management, right? Or tourism management or event management. And why should this be any different? Let's talk about the next trend, short video and live streaming. When you look at the download charts in Germany right now about social media, you will see familiar apps like Instagram and YouTube, and nowadays TikTok. When you look at international download charts, you will find TikTok all over again. So what is TikTok? TikTok is basically really short video, so it's mobile only. It is vertical video, 
and it's basically music, but also comedy. It's really, really short, so you watch it in a loop most of the time. And now if you think, hey, this kind of reminds me of Vine or Musical.ly, you are correct, because it kind of borrows some of the same elements. And actually, this new app, TikTok, is a merger between TikTok and Musical.ly. So Musical.ly before was also a Chinese app, but nobody knew about it because it had a Western name, Musical.ly. But then TikTok bought it, and now they're rolling it out internationally. And I think in the past, Musical.ly, for you guys, maybe you thought, hey, this is kind of interesting, but maybe too niche, because it's only like for very young kids, and it's only this lip sync, karaoke, Lisa and Lena type of style. But now, with the new TikTok app, music is only a small part of it, and actually has many more use cases, but for a short video. Maybe also interesting, the parent company of TikTok is the company ByteDance, and this company is currently valued at $75 billion. So a company that nobody in the West has ever heard of, and just for comparison's sake, BMW is currently valued at like 50 billion, and this ByteDance company is valued at 75 billion. Again, shows you how large those companies have become. Another quite interesting trend in China is live streaming. This again is different in the sense that um, it's also vertical video, but people are showing basically their, their lives. It's like Instagram stories 24 seven. And they will maybe sometimes show you some interesting stuff like makeup tips or fashion tips, sometimes not so interesting stuff like they will just film themselves while they're eating, but a lot of people really enjoy this. And now the question is, how do they actually make money? As a user, you have the opportunity to buy some virtual gifts for them. And so basically, as a user, you will buy, let's say, 1,000 coins for 10 euros. So every coin is like one cent. And let's say, if I'm the streamer and you like me a little bit, maybe you will invite me to a beer, which is like one cent, right? And if you like me a lot, maybe you will give me a crown or even a supercar. But then the supercar is already worth 3,000 coins, and that's 30 euros. And then I will share the revenue with the platform. And now you might wonder, OK, but how big can this really become? How many beers or virtual flowers can I really get? And guys like this one, he's like a rapper in China. He's making like over 10 million a year at 25 years old just by getting those virtual gifts. And if you take together the revenue of all of those live streaming platforms, it's actually already a bigger industry than the movie industry in China. So again, just a lot of dynamism that has taken off in the past couple of years. The next topic are key opinion leaders. And key opinion leaders are somewhat similar to influencers in the West. But in Asia, they're called KOLs. They connect social media and e-commerce really, really well. Obviously, in the West, we also have product placement. But I think there's not such a tight connection between social media and e-commerce as in Asia. So some examples. This guy, Mr. Bags, he's like the most well-known guy for like luxury and handbags. And he was able to sell bags worth $200,000 in 12 minutes through his social channel. This girl is also an influencer. And she did a cooperation with Mini, the car company. And basically, she only sent out like three posts. The first one was, hey, fans, something exciting is coming up. Then one week later, she said, hey, I'm actually doing a cooperation with Mini. And there's going to be a Mini special edition with my design and my colors. And then the third post was, hey, fans, now it's up. Now you can buy it. And within 10 minutes, she sold like 100 cars worth $50,000 each. And this, again, shows you how much influence the KOLs have in Asia and also how far ahead mobile payment channels are in order for people to actually do such a transaction. And so in China, you have lots of different live streaming platforms right now. And it's super interesting that Taobao and Tmall are kind of similar to eBay and Amazon. So you have to imagine it's as if Amazon and eBay now had some content channels. Black Friday is going to be this week. And I think it's super boring when you go to the Amazon side because there's basically just some bargain products, but there's not a lot of entertainment. Whereas in China, if you go to an e-commerce website, entertainment and media is really a must. And the influencers, they will actually go on the show and say, hey, this Friday from 8 to 9, we will introduce our new collection. We will answer questions. We will interact with you during the live stream. People can send in questions. So they will show the prototypes. Then maybe after an hour, they will sell 10,000 of each. And afterwards, they put the prototypes into the factories. And just a couple of days later, all the products will come in, in the mailbox of the customers. So this is really fast fashion. Because in the West, when we talk about fast fashion, it's like, hey, it's Sarah and H&M. They can produce like, I don't know, 10 collections every year. And these guys can do it within a couple of days. So it's really a new kind of shopping. And actually, when you think of it, it kind of reminds you of teleshopping which is kind of old school or doesn't have a, the greatest reputation maybe in the West. 
but I think you can reinvent this kind of teleshopping if you do it with influencers, with KOLs, and if you maybe also use social media and make it more interactive where you can chat with people the whole time. So Chinese influencers, most of them have their own fashion brands. Five of the top 10 brands on Taobao are actually influencer brands. So it would be similar to like the Stefanie Giesinger brand or the Lena Gerke brand, which probably also already exists, but maybe not at that scale, because some of them are already making like hundreds of millions every year just by selling their own collection. So the final question now is, okay, now we've seen those trends. Which of these will actually come to Europe or do some of them already exist? As I said before, TikTok is really coming to Europe. It actually already has 500 million users, so it's not like a small thing. And now it will be interesting for us in the media, for you guys maybe in advertising to see Will it be closer to a Snapchat Musical.ly or Pinterest or closer to an Instagram in terms of user numbers and user engagement? As you know, Facebook has basically killed off Snapchat by copying all the features for Instagram stories. Now they're trying to do the same. They're trying to copy TikTok and now they have their own app called Lasso that they are now testing in some countries and which they want to roll out internationally pretty soon. When it comes to influencer marketing, obviously really, really big in the West as well. The difference is, is that in the past they lived mainly off product placement, but now they're also getting into their own products. And I think the best example for that is uh, Kylie Jenner with her company Kylie Cosmetics, where she's selling cosmetics for hundreds of millions of dollars without doing any traditional advertising, everything only through her own brand. And a couple of months ago, she was in the press as the America's youngest billionaire, because now she's 20 years old and has built a billion dollar company basically. And the funny thing about it is that when she was at 950 million net worth, somehow her fans learned about the possibility that she could become the youngest billionaire in the US ever. And then they just bought some even more stuff to help Kylie out a little bit. So it's not really about the products, but just about the fandom and the loyal followers. I think connecting social media or media in general and commerce, it's going to be the next big thing. And we can see glimpses of that already with Instagram, where I think that the shoppable products on Instagram are really a fantastic way to buy stuff because every day we see inspirational pictures on Instagram. And then the question was in the past, hey, how do I buy this stuff? And then in the past, you could only go to the link in the bio. And now they're expanding stuff like shoppable products. And finally, I think one thing that kind of summarizes a lot of the trends right now in media is this game Fortnite. So who of you is playing Fortnite or who has kids who are playing Fortnite? Yeah, it's really a phenomenon, I think. In some months, they're doing like 300 million in sales, 300 million a month. And the game is free to play. They only live off virtual items that you can buy. And those items, they don't even help you to improve your game. So it's not like you're buying new weapons or anything. You're just buying like some new skins, some new clothes, maybe some new victory dances where your character can dance after they've won. And now all the kids, when they get like Christmas money or birthday money for 30 or 50 euros, all they want to have is like a voucher for Fortnite in order to be able to buy the latest skin. We talked about esports previously. The thing about esports is that all the young people want to do it, but you have to be so good and have so fast reactions that sometimes at 22, you're already too old for esports. You cannot be an esports athlete anymore and you have to retire because you're just too old and too slow. Fortunately, there's a second career afterwards. And this guy is a pretty good example for that. So this guy is called Ninja, and he's like the top streamer on Twitch, where he showcases playing Fortnite all the time. And as you know, there's the possibility of a paid subscription plan on uh, Twitch, where basically people are paying him, but actually they could see all the content for free. They actually only pay because they want to support him. So they buy this kind of membership. It's as if he had his own Netflix, and so people are paying $5 a month or $10 a month. And actually this guy right now sitting in his basement playing Fortnite is making like $1 million per month. So this is not surprising why maybe today all the girls want to become the ne next Kim Kardashian or the next Kylie Jenner and all the guys want to become esports guys or the next Ninja. But again, it shows you how much people are willing to pay if they really like something and if they want to have that content. It must be kind of maybe even disturbing for traditional media companies who are trying so much in order to get a paid offering off the ground and put years and millions of dollars of effort into it and at times are not as successful as this one guy from his basement. So to summarize it, I think interesting media trends for 2018 is that you need to have this really mobile only mindset. And this doesn't only mean to have an app or to be an Instagram, but really think about mobile use cases that don't exist on desktop. The second thing is that esports and Twitch, I think are huge. If you want to reach young people, especially young men, I think this is the perfect area in order for you to present your brand or do advertising, either through your own channels or in corporations. The third one is short video on TikTok and also Instagram. I think IGTV taking off quite slowly, so I'm kind of wondering 
how this is going to go. But if you see that nowadays Instagram Stories is already the most important product for Instagram, more important than Facebook, or more important than the Instagram feed, you can see that people can't get enough of short video. The fourth one are KOLs and influencer brands. So look for more influencers to turn their personal brand into actual product brands. And the fifth one is that live streaming and e-commerce will lead to a renaissance in shopping. And overall, I hope this gave you a good impression about what's going on in China right now. And if you want to learn more about digital trends, about what the future may look like, make some time for two trips every year. Don't go to Mallorca every year. You've been to Mallorca enough. Try to go to Silicon Valley. Try to go to China. Yeah, I hope you took away some new trends. Thank you. Thank you, Tulam. What can we learn more um, apart from these three uh, strategic issues? Is uh, there another secret uh, of China what we could learn from? Yeah, so what are the Chinese people doing right? And I realize that there's a lot of stuff that may not work over here. But I think three things are quite interesting. The first is that the government is really pushing technology really, really hard. I think in Germany it's more of an afterthought. Best example, last week Angela Merkel announced that there's going to be this huge German AI push. So they're going to invest $3 billion into AI. $3 billion kind of sounds nice, but actually just MIT, the university alone in the US, is going to invest $1 billion. And the city of Shanghai is going to invest $15 billion. So we have Germany as a country, $3 billion, one college, $1 billion, and one city, $15 billion. So I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is that they uh, yeah, really put a lot of emphasis on education. We talked about the school system before. So actually, Chinese kids, they will learn coding in Python in primary school because the Chinese state has recognized that this is actually important. And I think it's actually a good thing because there's no law where it's written that you only can learn how to code if you're like a computer science student in Germany at 24 years old. So they're really pushing education forward. Everybody's really eager to learn. And the third thing is that they're also working really, really hard. The Chinese work philosophy, you can basically summarize it with 996. And 996 stands for work from 9 in the morning until nine in the evening, six days a week. So 996 is instead of our nine to five. So I don't know if it would be the right thing for me. I kind of like my work-life balance, but you can imagine if there's like 80 million people over here in Germany working nine to five, and there's one billion people over there working the 996, you can just see how they can make such fast progress.